And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel today. Thank you so much for joining us here in our program. This program is brought to you by Churches of Christ and interested individuals. And we're thankful for their support. We're especially thankful for you and the interest you show in this program, both on television as well as on the radio. Also, it's on YouTube. So we're glad to be able to have these outlets to present this Bible material. Today in our study, we're going to be taking a look at a topic we've chosen to entitle Baptism, God's Dividing Line. If you watch this program regularly, you'll know that we've been dealing with a number of those who mock God by criticizing or ridiculing what the New Testament teaches on baptism. And that's certainly unfortunate. Today we want to look at an affirmative presentation of baptism as God's dividing line. We're going to use a text that I believe is one of the clearest and most thorough presentations found in our New Testament of New Testament baptism and what it is and how effective it is and what it does. And that text will be Romans, the sixth chapter. So if you have your Bible handy, you may want to get that out. We'll be looking at a lot of verses there in Romans, the sixth chapter. You know, as we take a look at our Bible, we find that there are some times, and I'd like to mention three times before we come to New Testament baptism, that God used water as a dividing line to separate the righteous from the wicked, to separate those who had an honest and good heart from those who had a dark and deceptive heart. And I want to notice those three times with you in our Bible that we have. First, during the days of Noah, we have reference being made to the days of Noah by the Apostle Peter himself. In this passage of Scripture in 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21, we discover Peter taking our thoughts all the way back to the ancient patriarch Noah when the world was wicked and God had chosen to destroy the world with a flood. And in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, Peter says, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In these verses we learn that the Apostle Peter is talking about the effectiveness of water and pointing back to that time in the Old Testament in the great worldwide flood when God destroyed a wicked world using water and he used that same water to lift Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth and their wives and the animals who'd gone in two by two to lift them above the wicked world on that water. You'll find that God used water as a dividing line. Perhaps that's why Peter says, as he does there in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, the like figure, that is the corresponding type, it matches, just like the type impressed on a page matches that which impressed that type on that page. Noah's flood is utilized as a type, and we have the corresponding antitype in our New Testament. And what is it? It is baptism. What happened in Noah's flood? The people were saved by water that were saved, Noah and his family. The rest died in a wicked world. The life figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. I want you to notice the three-letter word now, N-O-W. It has an element of time in it, now. There are those who are going to be rejecting baptism who will substitute one letter in that word, the W. They'll put a T there. And they'll say baptism does not save us. We saw some prominent leaders in one of the largest denominations in the United States put a T for a W and change the word now to the word not. And 14 million people are following that error created there by those who've formerly been heads of that denomination. It ought not to be. And average people like you and me ought to stand up against that and point that out. If it were not the case that these local pastors have such power over the members of the congregation, somebody would have enough love for God and appreciation for the revealed will of God 
to point that out to that pastor. It says, now save us. It doesn't say, does not save us. It says, baptism doth also now save us. The devil is very crafty and deceptive. He will harden the hearts of people thinking that's no big deal when it is stating just the opposite of what God said. So there is a time then, the flood, where God used water as a dividing line to separate the righteous from the wicked, and Peter's saying that's what God is doing with it today. The second instance I'd like to give you comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Here, the Apostle Paul is pointing back to the children of Israel, and he references them as the fathers in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, who were being now freed from slavery and delivered across the Red Sea as the waters were divided, and the cloud that was leading them covered them. They were entirely submerged in the Red Sea under the water and covered by the cloud. Of that, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Here's an example being used by Paul now to show how that all of our fathers, that's all the Israelites who came out of slavery, were baptized. Into what were they baptized? They were baptized into Moses. They were under Moses' law. The Bible tells us the day they came out, recorded for us in the 14th chapter of Exodus, in verse 21, that they were saved that day. How were they saved? By being baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So there you have a time, again, where God uses water as a dividing line. The wicked Pharaoh tries to chase the children of Israel down to re retrieve them and bring them back under slavery, and they are destroyed in that water. The children of Israel are freed through that water, the Red Sea. God is using water as a dividing line. He's using baptism, mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 10, 2, as his dividing line. Moving down centuries later to our New Testament times, we find the cousin of Jesus Christ preparing the way for him, calling people to Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John 1, by baptizing them in Jordan. When they came down to the Jordan and all of Jerusalem and Judea and the region round about Jordan came down to the Jordan River and they were baptized of John in the Jordan as they were confessing their sins. His message was for them to repent. He was baptizing them for the remission of their sins. That's right. Mark 1.4 and Luke 1.77 tell you that he was baptizing them for the remission of sins. In fact, you can read more verses in Luke about that. Luke 1.33, for example. Now, here is how water was being used as a dividing line. In Luke chapter 7, verse 29 and 30, Luke wrote, and all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized of him. God was using the preaching of John to separate those who would be righteous, who would receive forgiveness of sins, from those who were, who were rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. A careful student of the Bible will realize that not only was John baptizing thusly and preaching repentance, but also Jesus Christ came preaching repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. And Jesus himself made and baptized more disciples than did John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. It's quite intriguing then to see how God is using baptism as a dividing line to distinguish those who will accept his counsel, honor his counsel, and receive his word from those who will not. Those today who are tampering with baptism, saying it's not necessary to salvation, or as one preacher said, if you think you were baptized to be saved, even though Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16, if you think you were baptized to be saved, 
Your baptism is void, empty, meaningless. Something Jesus said to do is empty and meaningless. And I've had those of that denomination to tell me it is false doctrine to teach what the Son of God taught in Mark 16, 16. People in that church ought to be calling those guys to account for that. Souls are at stake here, ladies and gentlemen. Mine is one and yours is one. I do not want to be led astray by a lie. So we've established just now in our study as we begin, we want to be looking at the text in Romans 6. Romans 6 is one of those places where God uses baptism as a dividing line. We've seen that in the days of Noah. We've seen that in the days of Moses. We've seen that in the days of John the Baptist and the personal ministry of Jesus. And now we see that today with New Testament baptism. When we say New Testament baptism, the reason we say that is because Jesus Christ is the giver of the New Testament. And Jesus Christ is the one who commissioned baptism to be preached. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. The American Standard Version says, making disciples of them by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We see repentance and remission of sins connected with that baptism in the parallel text in Luke chapter 40, uh, 24, verse 46 and 47, and its fulfillment in Acts 2. So when we say New Testament baptism, that's why we refer to it in that way. Christ, who said this cup is the New Testament, in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, in Matthew 26, 28, commissioned his disciples to go preach and teach and baptize and continue to teach. That's why we call it New Testament baptism. Now, for a discussion of baptism, and I think one of the clearest texts and most focused texts on the subject of baptism in our New Testament, we turn to Romans chapter 6. Now, when we come to Romans chapter 6, I'd like, if I might, to share with you the context of Romans in the sixth chapter. Notice with me as we begin to look at this chapter that the Apostle Paul is making a statement in the last verse of chapter 5. He says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice, please. That sin reigned and the result is death. But now then in contrast to that, and Paul begins that contrast in chapter 5, even earlier and continues it through chapter 6, grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the central focus of why Christ came into the world, to seek and to save that which is lost. Matthew eighteen eleven, Luke 19 and verse 10. Grace reigns through righteousness. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 1 John 3 at verse 7. Here the Apostle Paul begins a discussion about righteousness and doing what is right. And he brings up an attitude prevalent among them that is so widespread today it is literally overwhelming. Stated in chapter 6 as we begin to look at it, verse 1. Where Paul has this question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The King James Version says, God forbid. The American Standard Version, may it not be so. It is an emphatic. What's he saying? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it not be so. May it never be mentioned once among you that people are sinning in order to be recipients of God's grace. Remember, sin came and death reigned by sin, and now then, grace reigns through righteousness with the end objective eternal life. So those people today, it's interesting to me, the same group that are criticizing New Testament teaching on baptism, those are the same ones who are saying that you can sin all you want and grace covers it. Now they won't put it that way a lot of times. Here's the way they put it. We're saved by faith only. As long as you believe, nothing else saves you. Faith only. That's what the word only means. Faith by itself. They also emphasize it this way. They'll say, once you're saved, you are always saved. And sometimes they will elaborate. 
There is no sin that you could commit that would undo what Jesus did to save you on the cross. That is the very idea and false doctrine the Apostle Paul is counteracting with the sixth chapter of the book of Romans. Now, you might wonder why it is sometimes. You may be in a church where they study the Bible, and they're studying through the Bible, and when you get to Romans 6, well, what happened to the discussion of Romans 6? We studied 5 and skipped over to 7. Well, what happened to 6? We didn't study. Well, we read through it, but we didn't. we'll reserve comment on that. We won't talk about it. Because Romans 6 is the passage of Scripture that tells you God uses baptism as his dividing line to separate the righteous from the wicked. And as we look at Romans chapter 6 and see the important place of baptism, it is in baptism that our old man of sin is crucified or put to death. And the new creature comes out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life. That's a kind of summary statement about Romans 6 appearing there in verse 4. It is accomplished in baptism. Now let me tell you, I've thought about this and I have discovered there are three reasons that come to my mind why people have trouble with Romans 6. Number one, they are going to overlook it or avoid it. That's what most do who don't believe baptism is necessary. Or like the prominent for the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, if you believe you needed to be baptized to be saved, your baptism is void. Baptism does not save. Remember, we wore the tape out playing that clip from that guy. Now, why do they say that in view of Romans 6? What do they do with Romans 6? Oftentimes, people will say, what do they do with this passage of Scripture? What do they do with Romans 6? They avoid it. They overlook it and avoid it. That's one of the things that oftentimes you'll find them doing with it. If they don't avoid it, they are simply going to deny it. They will deny that it teaches. One of the statements I want to look at with you in a moment is, well, there's no water in Romans 6. They want to take all the water out of Romans 6. If they don't avoid it, they'll deny it, that it is, has anything to do with salvation. And if they don't avoid it or deny it, they will rest it or twist it to try to make it say something that it doesn't. Usually they'll say, well, it just symbolizes when you're saved by faith only. No, it's not talking about faith only in Romans 6. He's talking about something that is to be done. So now with that in mind, that Romans 6 is a definitive text explaining baptism, let's take the amount of time that we have left, and I'd like you to stay with me. We're going to really get into the heart of the lesson now to go to Romans 6. I have, for those of you watching on television, some of the verses from Romans 6. I don't have the whole 23 verses in the chapter, but I do have a few of them posted here for your edification. If you're listening by radio, well, you've got to listen anyway, so you'll get this. In Romans 6, we start with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together with him, or planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Notice what Paul is doing. He is answering the question, do we, we get more grace by sinning more? If we do, let's sin more because then we'll be receptive of much more grace than anyone else. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be named once. And he answers that, by pointing back to the time when they became Christians, the time when they crossed God's dividing line of water by being baptized. He points them back to the time when he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Why is he reminding them that when they were baptized, they were baptized into his death? Because Jesus shed his blood in his death. John 19, 33 to 35. And they were baptized into his death where he shed his blood, that the blood of Christ might be applied to the sinful condition of their souls and their sins 
be washed away, as Acts 22, 16 very clearly says. Or as Peter stated in Acts 2, 38, their sins are remitted or forgiven upon that baptism. He points them back to that time. Your sins were forgiven. You didn't become a Christian to keep on sinning. And this false doctrine is an incentive to sin that you can, once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never so sin as to be finally lost. Yes, you can. And it does, if it's an effrontery. It is a disrespect to the teaching of God's will for people to incite such error as that into the hearts and minds of the people in their congregations so that they have no problem about sinning. And the more they sin, they believe the more grace they get. Once saved, always saved. No, that is false teaching. Paul said, don't you remember you were baptized into Christ? You were baptized into his death. That's how serious it is. Verse 4, therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death. Once again, baptized into his death where he shed his blood. That, like his Christ, was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Now, that's why he's mentioning baptism. That the day we obeyed the gospel, by hearing the gospel of Christ and believing it, Romans 10 and verse 17, by repenting of our sins, that's what they were taught to do, Romans 2, 4, by confessing our faith that Christ is, our son of, is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10, with the mouth that confession is made unto in the direction towards salvation. Then they were baptized, as reviewed here by the inspired apostle himself, into the death of Christ, that the old man of sin might be crucified. He's put to death. He's gone. He doesn't need to continue to live, that we might be new creatures in Christ Jesus. And then the essentiality of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I've taught people across the years, and I've seen them light up to an understanding of what baptism is when you read that it is essential here in verse 5. For if we have been planted together with, planted together, excuse me, in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Notice, if we've been planted in the likeness of his death, baptized into Christ, that's how we were planted there. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. In order for us to be in the likeness of his resurrection, it is essential that we are baptized. Six, knowing that this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, sometimes people will look at this and they will, they will begin to see, you know, baptism, it is essential. That is when, watch, here's how you know how. We're baptized into something. This is not a matter of what we, just what we believe. It's based upon what we believe. But it is a matter of what we do. For you'll find baptism is into the death of Christ. Baptism is into Christ. We are to obey the form of doctrine delivered us. We read later in verses 16 to 18. And he says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you. Being then, when? When you were baptized. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. One has said, You are saved and then baptized. No. Then is when you're baptized, when you're saved. That's when you're saved, is when you're baptized. Being then made free from sin. That's why I call this a definitive text. And notice, we're baptized into something. You believe the form of doctrine because it requires us to believe Christ died, was buried, and rose again to be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But how do you obey that? You obey that by doing something. What do you do? You go down into the water where you are buried and your old man of sin is crucified and you are forgiven of your sins and you are raised to walk in newness of life. Some will say, well, that symbolizes, baptism symbolizes salvation by faith only. Baptism is a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection and of our identifying with it then, like we saw the word now in 1 Peter 3.21. Now, let me answer an objection that I see sometimes and get in. Uh, some have said this to me. Baptism, 
is mentioned three times in this text here, this Romans 6. Yet, notice this, opponents of Jesus Christ will argue this, there is no water in Romans 6. Opponents of Christ will argue there is no water in Romans 6. That's a lame attempt, like I said earlier, to rest this scripture. I tell you, it's almost humorous to see these people trying to rest. Do you know if you start trying to wring the water out of Romans 6, you can wring enough water out of this text to fill up a bad baptistry and immerse somebody fully into Christ. Let me show you how I know that. The word baptism is found three times in this text. Now, I want to give you the definition. If we were Greek people, we wouldn't need to do this. You'd already know it. But since we're not, let's go to the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament that is compiled by Dr. Joseph Henry Thayer. It's viewed as a standard work on defining these words. Observe this definition of baptizo. That's the word for baptism. You can recognize it when it's pronounced. It means to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water. Ladies and gentlemen, water is included in the definition that you see here in the Greek dictionary of the word baptism. That's where your water is. It is in baptism. You can't have baptism without an element. And the element of water is included in baptism. That's the verb form of the word. Let me give you the noun form of this word. It's not here in these three instances, but it's the same word in its noun form. Baptismos is the word we're looking at. And again, Thayer defines it as a washing. Watch this. Purification effected by means of water. That's what the lexicographer says baptism means. Where is the water? Well, you don't have the word water there. The word water is included in the word baptism. That's what it means. Purification effected by means of water. It's on page 95 of his Greek dictionary. So baptism is mentioned three times in this text, yet opponents of Christ will argue there is no water in Romans 6. That is a shame, ladies and gentlemen that somebody would stoop so low as to teach that false doctrine, contrary to the flat-out, straight-up meaning of the word baptism. In Romans 6, we have been able to see that we are baptized into Christ. That's how we get into Christ, baptism into Christ, Romans 6, 3. We have seen that we are baptized into His death, where we contact the merits of His shed blood. We have seen that it is then and there that we are raised to walk in a new life. And we have seen it is essential that if we've been planted together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Our old man is crucified and the new man stands forth. I'm so glad we had a chance today to take a look at this text from Romans chapter 6, showing that baptism is God's dividing line. If you've not obeyed the gospel and we can help you, please contact us. 159 Browns Ferry Road, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37419, or an email, which is ethicalmediamail at gmail.com. Thank you for being with us today.